So good afternoon. My name is Livio Matei. I am the head of the School of Education, Communication and Society here at King's. And I would like to welcome most warmly everyone in person and online to uh, this Education and Society dialogue on uh, higher education and science diplomacy in times of peace and war. This is the second event in our series, this time organized jointly with King's International Education Network. The series started, as many of you would know, a few months ago. Today's event is the second. The first one was about higher education and knowledge as a public good. I'm not sure whether that was an easier topic than the one for tonight or not, but just maybe. We imagine this series as a platform for bringing together academics and students, and it's so good to see the students in the room, education leaders and professionals, policy makers, regulators, and media representatives from the UK and the world to identify and address contemporary issues in the broad area of education and society. And in particular, we want to look at uh, issues that are important, but perhaps don't attract enough attention in academic and public arena discussions. These dialogues are based on research and practice, both of them, and they reflect, we hope, the interdisciplinary nature of our work at ECS, which combines research, teaching, and service to society. Uh, one particular ambition of this series that I would like to mention is to reach out to colleagues in other units at King's and in our Faculty of Social, Science and, for Social Sciences and Public Policy who have similar preoccupations. And we want to do this in order to learn from them, <coughs> given that a lot of research on education and society is done elsewhere at the faculty and, and King's, so we'd like to learn from them. But also, if I may disclose this, we hope to use these discussions internally as an opportunity for generating ideas regarding eventual federative or joint projects in this area, education and society across the faculty and the college. So I am very grateful to our colleagues from the China Law Institute and Defense Studies at SSPP for accepting the invitation to join today's panel. Well, of course, if we are talking about an inclusive uh, platform to discuss education and society, that must involve others from outside the college uh, as well. And I am equally grateful to members of the panel, not from KCL for joining today, and they are from uh, British Council and Royal Holloway University. We had another participant confirmed from the European University Institute Florence, but she literally lost her voice, so she cannot uh, join, not even online. She might be able to wave at, uh, uh, at some point. And of course, this is a public event, so it's not only about panelists from uh, Kings or not from Kings, and I would like to thank once again everybody from attending. Now, very few words, why higher education and diplomacy, and why at times of peace and war? There are several reasons for proposing this theme, and members of the panel will address some of the most important of them. Now, if I were to list just a few keywords denoting uh, the main motivations for selecting this theme, those are enough to form an entire word cloud, including items, entries such as responsibility of and for higher education, solidarity, hidden politics, good guys and bad guys diplomacy, new Cold War, fractures in the world, one world or multiple worlds, international relations, higher education science and democracy, war in Ukraine, cooperation with Russia, cooperation with China, cooperation with Egypt, support for Myanmar, support for Afghanistan, international cooperation and the crisis of academic freedom in Europe, frozen conflict and forgotten suffering, and so on. I will not develop any of these sub-themes uh, myself, but one overarching theme I hope will come up in uh, our discussions is about the responsibility of academics and universities uh, with regard to higher education and science diplomacy. So is there any responsibility here for us? And if yes, how do we go about it? Also, considering that current times are different from what we have known recently, 
including in the first two decades of the millennium, and considering that we now have open and cold tensions and wars that nobody expected, do we in universities and others need to think differently about higher education and science diplomacy? And what do we need to know for this, to think differently and perhaps act differently? So the order of proceeding tonight will be as follows. We start with remarks by members of the panel, up to seven, eight minutes uh, each. That will be followed by a short discussion among uh, members of the panel, if they feel like they want to react to uh, something that other colleagues said, or perhaps add to uh, what, they, what they said themselves. And then we'll open up for a, discussions with, for a discussion with the audience and questions and also comments from the audience uh, are welcome, both from the room and online. And I think in the name of, uh, I think I can see Diane here, yes. So I think in the name of inclus inclusiveness, right? Not inclusivity, inclusiveness and uh, participation, it would be possible for colleagues joining online to turn on their camera and just speak to us rather than just putting uh, uh, com comments or question in the, in the chat. So, uh, if I may now turn to the members of the panel for their interventions in this order. Madeleine Ansel, Madeleine is Director for Education at the British Council. Ben O'Laughlin, Professor of International Relations at Royal Holloway University. Jane Hayward, Lecturer in China and Global Affairs at King's College London. And Ben Kinzel, Reader in Security Cooperation, also King's College London. So thank you very much all of you for coming, and Madeleine, you have the floor. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I always feel something of a fraud because I don't even have a doctorate, but I think I'm invited because, um, because I'm the Director of Education in a cultural relations organization. Recording in progress. That has since its foundation what might be described as soft power objectives. We were founded in the late 1930s, and in the 1940s, our mission was described as to create in a country overseas a basis of friendly knowledge and understanding of the people of this country, of their philosophy and way of life, which will lead to a sympathetic appreciation of British foreign policy. And in our latest corporate plan, which was published earlier this year, the idea has been expressed as to support peace and prosperity by building connections, understanding, and trust between people in the United Kingdom and countries worldwide. We operate at arm's length from the UK's political processes to ensure we build long-term trust abroad while supporting the international aspirations of the four governments of the UK. So the question of the role of higher education and science diplomacy in times of peace and war is fundamental to what we do. And the concept of trust is key to the way in which we carry out our mission, because trust is a social capital on which soft power operates. We need other countries to trust us for our interactions to go beyond the transactional and become influential. And we believe that this trust must not only be between governmental leaders, but extend to people-to-people -people engagements involving state and non-state actors, civil society including universities and academics, and also private sector enterprises. In our 2018 report, The Value of Trust, we explored what drives trust, and it finds, based on surveys of people aged 18 to 34 in the other 19 G20 countries, that trust in people from the UK was strongly associated with the belief that the UK supports and encourages the values that respondents think are important. And these values include openness, contribution to international development and cooperation. And this has influenced our British Council organisational values, which include the concept of mutuality, seeking to respect and engage with the strengths and interests of others, rather than simply transmitting our own. It also found that there's a correlation between people's interest in engaging with the UK and how much they trust the UK, and vice versa. With increased engagement with the UK, 
increasing positive perceptions. And this has the potential for creating a virtuous circle where engagement builds trust and leads to greater appetite for further engagement. Our 2019 report, Sources of Soft Power, explored what it is about the UK that will attract engagement. The UK scored very highly and second only to the USA as a place to study. And this in turn was driven by factors such as positive perceptions of its educational system, the prestige of its universities, the English language, accessibility and values. And this high scoring has been consistent since our first survey in 2016. But the gap is narrowing with growing competition from countries like Canada and Australia. Other organisations have drawn similar conclusions. The Portland Soft Power Report of 2019, which placed the UK second in its index in um, nations having the most soft power, reported that despite initial concerns about the impact of Brexit, UK universities have proven resilient with an increase in international student numbers. The UK is home to the second largest number of top universities in the world. Moreover, British-based researchers and academics make a disproportionately large contribution to academic publishing. Unfortunately, the Portland Soft Power Index has come to an end, and in the new brand finance survey, which may be looking to take this space, the UK comes out top for its education system, but lags behind China, Japan and the USA as a leader in science or innovative technology and tech companies which may be to do with the fact that we don't have a leading domestic brand, as well as our image being rich in heritage, but a bit fusty. Um, I also believe that education is particularly effective at building trust and understanding, because it reaches young people at a formative stage and positive experiences stay with them all their lives. And this is why the British Council actively supports the implementation of the government's international education strategy and the work of the UK's international education champion, both through running and co-funding the Study UK marketing campaign and putting resource in country into doing the groundwork and supporting visits by Sir Steve Smith and university representatives. International students who come to the UK have an unparalleled opportunity to develop an understanding of our values and ways of life as well as developing an increased appetite to engage with us again. It's also why we were the National Agency for Erasmus Plus and helped the Department for Education set up the Turing Scheme. We recognise that the UK needs people with a deep understanding of other countries and a desire to engage with them. We also have a number of smaller programmes aimed at increasing what we describe as China literacy as we are very conscious that they understand us much better than we understand them and that increasingly this matters. It's also why we supported the Newton Fund, essentially a science diplomacy fund that was about identifying and building science and research partnerships with emerging economies and why we hope to have a significant role in the new International Science Partnerships Fund that will replace it. The Newton Fund was developed when we were just beginning to understand that China's investment in science meant it would overtake the UK as the second biggest producer of research and would rival the USA. Although we are more aware of the risks of engaging with China now than we were then, most people would agree that China is too important, not just as a science power or as a sender of international students, but geopolitically and geoeconomically to ignore. More widely, we have a whole programme of work that aims at building connections between the UK and tertiary education systems overseas at government to government and institution to institution level. This is largely funded by the UK aid budget as it's primarily aimed at supporting the economic development and welfare of the partner country through building capacity in their tertiary education systems. We also believe that the connections created between the UK and the partner country are valuable for both us and them. I mentioned at the beginning that although we receive funding from the UK government, we operate at arm's length. And this is important, not only as Joseph Nye said, because there is a fine line between soft power and propaganda 
and legitimacy and credibility often depend on government not being involved, but also because it can create space for connections to continue where governmental relations are difficult. Some brief examples. I was told by a former UK ambassador to Israel that the BIRAX programme, which is a UK-Israeli fund that invests in regenerative medicine, provides a positive subject to begin with at meetings before moving to more difficult topics. With Saudi Arabia, we recognise that there is a desire in some quarters for a gradual move towards a more progressive society and that the UK can support this through facilitating education partnerships. In China, we believe that both sides hope that people-to-people -people engagement can continue, albeit with eyes wide open, despite some of the wider challenges in the UK-China relationship. And although the British Council is part of the UK Embassy to China, it's still understood that as an organisation we are separate from the UK government, and this can help us to respond to non-governmental demands, such as from the high numbers of Chinese parents who would like their children to have an opportunity to study abroad at a university with a strong brand where they will also be able to improve their English. There are, of course, limits to the degree where we can say we are working with civil society and not with government. In Russia, we continue to support engagement between UK and Russian universities, even after the murders of Alexander Litvinchenko and Dawn Sturgis, when many official ties were suspended. Our last delegation was, um, to Russia was in January, a month before the invasion of Ukraine, and we could not continue with our planned year of culture or any of the activities aimed at linking UK and Russian institutions once the Russian Rectors Forum had issued a letter of support for the invasion. And perhaps pleasingly to some, all the money that we were going to invest in that has been moved to supporting engagement with Ukraine. Thank you very much, Madeleine. I will just you know, note quickly that there was a lot in what you said that is based not only on practice but on research as well. So you <laughs> yeah. and the council are actually doing a lot of research. So I'm research. not doing the research. My <laughs> colleagues in the council are doing the research yeah, so and I'm reading it and are. trying to let it influence my practice. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Ben, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, as an international relations professor, I'm going to kind of throw the whole war and peace and geopolitics into this. Um, and thinking particularly about the United States, um, because it seems to have a, a fairly new and quite explicit policy about using higher education as a geopolitical tool. So um, the kind of context for this is the general shift from most leaders, certainly in the West, talking about liberal interdependence, maybe for 10 years ago, to um, a lot of talk now about competition. Competition is, is just the word that they're all using. Um, the Biden administration has explicitly said that they're following a doctrine of strategic competition. So how is this going to affect higher education? Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, um, gave a speech this summer where he was saying what America is doing, its whole foreign policy in the world, are driven by geopolitical competition and building coalitions on issues where there might be cooperation as possible, on climate change, for example. Um, but he saw it, this was quite um, dramatic language, as an in, right now, like 2022, is an inflection point comparable to 1947 when Truman started saying, right, this is how the liberal world order is going to be. And we'll have the Marshall Plan and we'll have various things. We'll build new institutions. Um, this is what Sullivan was kind of putting it in the context of. But once you got to the nitty gritty of how America would do competition here, there was a lot of talk about managing supply chains, which kind of fits the context we've had with COVID, and finding technological advantage. And he said that he saw world order um, in terms of what America has to do is have a small yard with a high fence, which really shocked me because that's not usually what um, a Democrat administration would say. By this small yard with a high fence, he's talking about not letting like, a sophisticated equipment and technology leave the United States and making sure that anybody who can make it comes to the United States and doesn't leave. Which just shocked me really, because I've got friends who've gone and studied in the US and then come home or gone back to their, whichever country they're from. Um, but this was, um, um, I don't know, it's, he said that um, we are not going to see the 
world entirely through the lens of strategic competition. But immediately, it kind of seems to have a spillover dynamic where if you're thinking in terms of strategic competition on a lot of issues, you're going to probably think about it in, term, in those terms on other issues a little bit, at least. So moving on to the kind of higher education aspect of this, Taron Chabra, who's Senior Director for Technology and Security with Biden, um, this year they managed to pass the CHIPS and Science Act. CHIPS is, I can never remember, careful help um, <laughs> for initiatives to build semi conductors basically. There's a P in there somewhere. Um, and it's gone through Congress um, and Chabra was said that um, it's going to work. Like Creating semi helpful incentives to produce semiconductors. That's the one. Thank you, Madeline. <laughs> Thank you, internet. Helpful incentives. That's <laughs> classic. Um, he said the problem is that 40% of semiconductor workers around the world aren't in America. How to get them into America? Which, again, think, I'm thinking, we're allies with you. Are you going to take all our semiconductor workers? Um, he was very um, explicit that the United States, if they get this, I mean, the midterms might complicate this, but um, they're going to expand the use of extraordinary ability visas so that if you do have some kind of scientific talent, you can go to America and stay in America long term. Which got me thinking, you know, do we have, we have global visitor... Global talent visas, I think. We've got the we office for talent, haven't we? we yeah. have, I have one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you're here. Yes. <laughs> so, but, but just the notion that we're going to start competing really quite explicitly to get talent. So if, if we're doing it and America is doing it, does this mean Italy is going to do it? Japan's going to, like, this is, this is the point of inflection that Jake Sullivan was talking about. He, he was, um, Chabra was very worried, he said, because he, you go around Silicon Valley and he said that you see posters that say, having trouble with your visa in America, come to live in X country. To, so to the administration, that was a sense of vulnerability that other countries are putting up posters in our country saying go to their country. Um, so uh, Chabra went on, this, in quotes, this means competing with allies. It is a necessarily complicated calculation. Like they're going to be, uh, I don't know, it could become more competitive anyway. Um, and the driver of all of this is security because he was saying that, you know, semiconductors, for example, could be used to make slightly more advanced missile technology. If people go to study in America, do a PhD or do a master's and then go back to Spain, and Spain develops better technology based on that PhD study, then Spain has an advantage over America. And for the Biden administration, that is unthinkable. So it was all about how do you, once you've attracted the talent, how do you keep them? Um, so I'm just going to kind of end with a few questions. So do we even know that masters and PhD students who go to the US want to stay in the US for the rest of their lives? How could we find out? What research could we do? Could we interview them? Like maybe some scholarships have that, you know, you get a full citizenship um, right with this scholarship, or maybe some don't, but we're kind of at a, an inflection point again of maybe working out, or in Washington, working out how to do that. So do, is that what students want? Secondly, if we did the same, would it work here? Because if our rivals or our allies are doing this, it wouldn't be unthinkable to do the same. It wouldn't be unpalatable. And then going back to the what is it for students, like do they feel slightly weaponized by this? Because both Sullivan and um, Chabra put this in the national security strategy context. This is what the security strategy is going to be. And if it's about maintaining technological advantage, then those talented students are targets who could come to America and become useful within the kind of technology security architecture. So, I mean, maybe students don't mind that. Maybe if you're 21 and you're offered full citizenship in America, it's worth it. But um, I'd love to do some research on this, basically. So to wrap up, um, we have this strategic competition as a probably a long-term condition now for the next couple of decades. So we can have the policy questions about 
what country is doing what in this competition context. Um, like, what are we doing with our visas? What are we doing with scholarships to, to move talent around in order to fulfill our foreign policy goals, our security interests primarily? And then there's finally the research question. Um, like, when I heard this, I was just thinking, I would love to talk to the young people about what are the pros and cons of it for them? How is this experience any different to if you were offered a four-year scholarship and then you just go home again? Like there's something qualitatively different. So how do young people feel as they're going through it? Because if this is going to work in the long run, then the young people would have to buy into it. They'd have to be comfortable with it. Otherwise, they might never go there. So um, I'll wrap up there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Jane. Thank you. you? Uh, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me if I'm sitting here? OK, great. Um, so I would like to start by talking about Confucius Institute, which is somewhat uh, in the news at the moment. Uh, last week, I believe, um, well, during the leadership contest, the prime ministerial uh, contest, the issue of Confu Confucius Institutes came up. Richie Sunak was asked, would you ban them if you were prime minister? That question came up again uh, in parliament uh, last week. Are you going to ban them? Um, Confucius Institutes have been called a threat to civil liberties in the UK, uh, and they have been referred to as academic malware. Um, so let me talk through a bit uh, what they are and what are some of the debates around them. Um, they were founded in 2004. They are at least ostensibly uh, cultural institutions, uh, language, mostly for language teaching, but also for language training. Um, they're sometimes compared to uh, the Goethe Institutes, which I believe teach German language, although I'm not very familiar with them. One big difference is that Confucius Institutes are embedded within host universities, so they're much more inside um, universities, which makes them stand out from other kinds of uh, language and cultural institutions. And they are, from the, f within China, they are, not within China, but the, the institutions over here are at the top, uh, underneath and attached to the Chinese Ministry of Education. Um, so they are, in that sense, they are state organs. Organisationally, they, um, they differ from place to place, but uh, very often or typically they're under the local supervision of the host university institution with staff that come from the PRC and they are hired in the PRC by state agencies. So we might, there might be questions around the hiring processes and the way that staff um, are vetted and the way that staff are trained. Um, I'll say a little more about that in a second. And very often the funding of the um, institute is split half from the host university and half from uh, the Chinese side. So this actually does a huge amount in terms of funding Chinese language studies in the UK and in other countries. Um, there have been concerns raised about Chinese staff at the Confucius Institutes um, interfering or influencing local affairs. And there are some cases which point to this. For example, in 2014, there was a case where um, there was a conference of the European Association for China Studies, uh, and the conference was partly funded by the Confucius Institute. And unbeknown to the organizers, a couple of pages from the program uh, went missing. Um, and they had been removed by the Com a Confucius Institute because they mentioned Taiwan. And I believe it was something fairly innocuous, like the name of a Taiwan funding organization, something like that. So that caused quite an outcry at the time. There was also a case in 2011 at a university in Canada where a Chinese teacher at a Confucius Institute, um, they have to sign a contract, uh, which is a Beijing um, organized or set up contract. And the contract says that you can't be a member of the Falun Gong, um, if I've got my facts right here. And it turned out that this teacher was a member of the Falun Gong and so was fired by the Chinese side. But of course, at a Canadian institution, you have um, freedom of religious expression. And so that was a huge problem 
um, for the Canadian University, and the result was that they shut down uh, the Confucius Institute there. So there are really problematic examples, but concrete examples like that do seem to be uh, quite few and far between. Um, I know lots of people at King's, actually, who have had previous training at uh, Confucius Institute in other universities and have talked about having great experiences there. Um, one problem is perhaps, as I referred to earlier, the vetting process, or at least this has been raised as a potential problem, the vetting process of uh, the teachers that come over here, the extent to which um, they are told that they can't say certain things, or that they should say certain things, for example, give uh, the PRC line on issues like Tibet or Taiwan if they are asked about it by students, um, or the extent to which they feel that there are certain things that they can't say. Um, to the extent that that is indeed the case, and of course it is very hard to study this or get empirical data on it, um, that would seem to be a somewhat unhealthy situation for... Um, for a university which bases its principles on um, uh, academic freedom of expression. Um, I have to say from my perspective, if I was going to raise issues about civil liberties in the UK, Confucius Institutes would not be the, in, uh, the issue that I would begin with. Um, and I would also say that for those uh, MPs uh, advocating for the banning of in Confucius Institute, uh, I wish that they would come up with an alternative funding package for uh, a training up students in the UK uh, in Mandarin because it's really, really lacking at the moment. Um, but I do want to put all of this into broader context because I think that uh, we are witnessing now a hardening of the political uh, atmosphere in terms of discussions towards China and it's very difficult to disentangle discussions about Confucius Institutes from this. Um, and one example uh, that I will talk about, which sort of puts this in a broader context, is the case of the China Initiative um, that has been, uh, which is a program put into practice in 2018 in the US under the Trump administration. Uh, and this is a program which was intended to guard against non-traditional forms of espionage. So normally espionage would be concerns about um, uh, the goings on within security agencies or defense institutions. But this, the China Initiative, was in particular um, looking at researchers and I, indeed I believe students at um, American universities um, concerned about uh, uh, largely intellectual property theft. And this became hugely uh, controversial and was very much criticized because the people that were targeted over and over again, they're American citizens, but over and over again, they're of Chinese ethnic uh, origin. And um, very, very often there was almost nothing or nothing to the cases, certainly in proportion to the amount of resources that were put into it. And there are some really egregious cases, such as the case of Professor Gang Chun, who was, uh, is a mechanical engineering professor at MIT, who under this program was very seriously harassed, members of his family very seriously harassed. He ran through an awful time that did serious damage to his Career and it turned out that there was absolutely nothing to the case at all and it was eventually dropped. But the China in Initiative has unfortunately done very serious damage to scientific uh, collaboration uh, between uh, the US and China. And um, it has been officially dropped under the China, uh, sorry, under the Biden administration. It was called to an end in uh, February 2022, although questions do remain about the extent to which it is carrying on if under um, a different name or a different brand. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Uh, right. uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you hear me well as well. Uh, first of all, thank you, Olivia, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, defense diplomacy. Um, I, I need to say uh, at the very beginning that, I don't, uh, that I'm here in a personal capacity, so I obviously don't represent any, uh, any, any uh, institution I'm working for. And I'm currently 
Well, I'm a, a, a reader in security cooperation at King's. I'm, I'm currently on a secondment to the Ministry of Defence, uh, where I work as the Director of Academic Studies at the Royal College of Defence Studies, um, the, uh, or uh, better known as RCDS. It is the senior college of the UK Defence Academy, which is in essence the uh, institution in the UK that provides postgraduate level education to uh, military personnel uh, or, or civilians or civil servants generally in, in, um, in areas that are related to, to international security. And uh, what, what these uh, institutions do, the, uh, the Defence Academy, the, the Royal College of Defence Studies, is, is generally known as, um, as professional military education. So, so the main objective is, is educational. Um, but at the same time, uh, or similar to, let's say, science diplomacy at regular universities, um, these institutions, not only in the UK, but partner institutions or comparable institutions around the world, are also engaged in, in something that uh, is often called defense diplomacy or defense engagement. Um, so, so uh, what I'm going to do in, in the few minutes I have, I'm going to talk a little bit about how this defensive pl diplomacy or defense engagement works, in particular at, at RCDS, the Royal College of Defense Studies. And, and I'll, I'll point out a couple of challenges that, that might be then uh, a springboard for, for the Q&A. I'd like to uh, <coughs> start um, with what we might call the internationalization of professional military education. And it might come as a surprise uh, uh, to some of you, but uh, while professional military education used to be a national matter, so basically the UK educated British, British officers or uh, British civil servants in, 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 in matters of security and, and defense. But during the last, uh, well, during the last few decades, I must say, at least since the 1970s, the, the, um, the, the participation in these uh, courses that these institutions offer has, has become very, very international. And uh, at RCDS, uh, we're uh, currently around two thirds of the students, so they are known as members, uh, but they're basically students, so two thirds come from abroad. So they're not British, they come from over 50 different countries. And, uh, and a lot of uh, the British uh, military personnel go to similar institutions abroad. So there, there happens quite a lot of exchange. And, and in essence, uh, professional military education, as, as we know today, is, 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 is very, very international. The members have yeah, very different backgrounds, uh, both civilian and military. Uh, they, what they all have in common is that their work has some sort of international security dimension. And from a defense diplomacy perspective, the idea really is here not only to provide education, uh, but also to, to bring people with very different backgrounds together to expose the participants in, in the courses to different views and perspectives uh, to facilitate uh, critical thinking, and perhaps most importantly, to create networks between former students, former members, depending on uh, the institution where, where they go to, that uh, will hopefully last uh, for a lifetime. And again, this is particularly important at, at the Royal College of Defense Studies, which, uh, which operates at what we call the strategic level. So it uh, it aims mainly at educating uh, future strategic leaders in their respective countries. And, uh, and if you look at the past, so you will find uh, RCDS graduates amongst uh, heads of state, um, uh, heads of security services, and, 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 and a lot of uh, defense attaches uh, around the world went, went through this or similar, similar programs. So the objective really is yeah, to create connections between, uh, between people working in similar areas, or, well, security area, uh, areas uh, around the world, to create networks at the highest level. 
and 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 the let's say the the ultimate objective is that uh, this has then you know uh, valuable a valuable impact for both the participating countries but also uh, for the UK and I can perhaps just point to two uh, recent examples uh, in, in, in Ukraine and, and Afghanistan. So in the case of, of Ukraine, Ukraine, we saw that uh, former members from Ukraine and the Baltic countries, they, they got in touch at the time of the invasion by, by, by Russia and, 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 and the Baltic members were able to help the families of the Ukrainian members uh, to, to escape uh, to, uh, to the Baltic countries and to escape to, to safety. And, and this is, you know, basically the idea of how these networks should 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 work in in, in practice. And we, we could see uh, or observe similar things occurring uh, during the withdrawal from from Afghanistan, where where former members from from Afghanistan and and from different countries uh, got in touch, and 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 and, and the Afghan members then got um, help with with escaping uh, uh, after the Taliban takeover. But let me turn now to, to some of the challenges. Uh, and I'd like to talk about four uh, in particular. So although in theory it, it all sounds you know, really nice and good, uh, especially the, the networking aspect of it, I think in practice it's very difficult <laughs> to maintain these networks in, in the long term to, to, um, to, to keep people connected. Uh, and, and well, one important reason is that uh, to maintain uh, these kind of networks, uh, and I guess we can see that at universities as well when they try to maintain alumni networks, it's really uh, resource and cost intensive. You need a lot of people to, to maintain practically these people, to get in contact with them, to organize events. And, 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 and uh, given the... Um, uh, how should I say the, the lack of resources that we can often find in the in the public service that that is not that is not uh, an easy thing to do. I think it has become a little bit easier uh, in recent years uh, with uh, social media at an informal level. So uh, you know WhatsApp groups, Facebook groups uh, exist, and, and and I'm still in touch via WhatsApp with with groups. You know going back uh, seven or eight years, and hopefully. You know, with social media becoming much more uh, mainstream uh, around the world, this is something that will facilitate uh, this. But I think I think it's very difficult, yeah, to maintain these networks, and and at the same time, it's it's also difficult, uh, let's say, to measure the concrete impact of of all of this, of 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 networking, of defence diplomacy. Um, so well, methodologically, it's difficult, uh, and and you know, there might you know you could have perhaps an interesting uh, research project uh, on that. Uh, but uh, apart from this anecdotal evidence that I've just pointed out, it's it's very difficult to to kind of trace actual impact and then show those who are uh, responsible for funding these type of activities uh, that that this is actually a very worthwhile a worthwhile uh, endeavor in, in the long term. Um, another, another challenge, I think, is, is something that we might call a broadly uh, curriculum design, or how do you design actually courses that brings together people <coughs> from over 50 different countries with very different backgrounds, very le different levels of education, and create an atmosphere that is actually very conducive to, to creating networks and, and, and connections. Um, I, I, th I think we, we've, we've kind of managed that uh, to a certain extent, uh, but it, it's a challenge e e each year to, uh, to, to, let's say, to address or to design a course on international security where you, where you don't automatically alienate uh, certain certain people from, from certain countries. The third challenge uh, 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 I want to, to get to is um, the issue of online education. Um, 
Obviously, with COVID-19, we all moved online, so did the UK Defence Academy, so did the Royal College of Defence Studies. <coughs> and, and when the, and now everyone is coughing, because so I'm going <laughs> to talk about COVID-19. Um, it's, um, um, there was a bit of a discussion about, yeah, using online education much more, because, well, it's more cost-effective. You don't have to get people from 50 different countries to the UK, you know, you could just put them all in a Zoom room and, and, and we could have good discussions. But what we've realized, and I think what, what is the result of these discussions, is that uh, if you want to be serious about defense diplomacy, if you want to be serious about engagement, I think it, it's probably true for science diplomacy as well, face-to-face -face in, uh, face -face interaction is just key, and it's key for the, the, the one key issue that uh, Madeleine uh, mentioned at, at the very beginning uh, of her presentation, that is trust and trust building. You cannot build trust via Zoom. It's kind of, it's kind of a weird <laughs> body. <laughs> we will hold you on that. <laughs> yeah, don't quote me on that. Um, but I, well, it, what we realized during COVID-19, trust building works online in very small groups, at least that's my personal uh, takeaway, but in larger groups it just doesn't work. Uh, you know, having coffee uh, together, having informal conversations on the corridor, there are just no substitutes for that. Um, so if you want to be serious about diplomacy, about science diplomacy, about defence diplomacy, do it face to face as much as you can. The last set of challenges uh, is uh, ha um, a question that Livia actually uh, posed uh, at, uh, when, when, when you got the invitation. Ha have things changed with recent conflicts? Have things changed with Af withdrawal from Afghanistan, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine? I, and, and my bottom line is, uh, not, not, not really. It's uh, at least in, in the narrow field of, of defense diplomacy or defense engagement via uh, professional military education. I think all that these conflicts have told us is that, that we need more defense diplomacy, we need more defense engagement, and, and we are clearly on, on, on the right uh, track there. I think the, the, the main challenge in terms of global crisis is rather uh, economic. So, you know, we, you all read the news, there's a looming, if not an already existing economic crisis, and, and that will have impact on, on public spending, it will have uh, uh, in, uh, in the significant impact on, on the resources that are out there. And if you don't, and, and all these things, science diplomacy, defense diplomacy, they cost money. And, uh, and, and because it's so difficult to actually show the impact, as I said before, it's also a bit of a challenge to, to justify spending in, in these areas. I hope we don't get there, but uh, on, on that note, I, I'd just okay. like to finish and then okay. hopefully we can have a good uh, question and answer session. Thank sure. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, and thank you. Thank you, all of you. So uh, you'll have a chance immediately to ask questions, comment to what the others said. I see that uh, Diane posted a, a comment. and uh, Diane, I'll take the freedom to read out. Uh, I mean, Diane agreed, but she probably cannot uh, talk still. So Dan is saying strategic competition of the US as a policy approach versus or alongside knowledge power Europe and the development of Macron European Universities Initiative so that they can compete in scale with large university systems around the world. Are we seeing the development of competition rather than cooperation, economic interest and instrumentalization of science rather than educational uh, exchange. So soft power trumped by sharp power is, is asking uh, uh, Diane. So this is comment as much as a, as a question, but you, you don't, you know, you shouldn't feel obliged to answer this is specific that, comment. You can, yes. Is that referring to universities in particular? Um, I think this is referring to a particular initiative okay. in, you know, that remote continent, Europe where now they are, it's actually only the European Union, to be more precise, they are building transnational universities that are supposed to be created by the international mergers of universities. So there are networks of universities that are being funded by the European Commission, and the idea is 
that in due time they will merge and create one institution. So, you know, I was one, King's is part of such a network still from before the, uh, before, well, it's after Brexit, but it's, the process started before. So, I know the idea is that universities like, I don't know, Sciences Po and Berlin and the University, University Florence will merge at some point and create uh, one university with one strategic development plan, one governance, and under European law, not national law. And Diane, I think, is implying that that's not in order to promote cooperation, but to promote competition, you know, create larger, powerful universities that are also European rather than national, you know, divided, small European uh, nations. So, you know, th this is my explanation and interpretation. I'm not sure that exactly what I am. But this is one of the most interesting uh, initiatives in higher education in, in Europe. Whether it will succeed or not, like many other uh, European universities, we, we don't know as yet. It's very recent. Yes? Yeah, I, I've got a couple of, of reflections on that. The first is that I think universities have always competed. So the idea that there was a golden age of, you know, of warm-hearted collaboration is probably not true. Um, I know that many, many countries seek to have a university as part of their national prestige, and if they're a relative, you know, if they're a country with younger universities, they quite often seek to achieve this by getting out the checkbook and trying to attract really eminent academics who will, you know, um, conduct research that's highly cited, will move up the league tables, and, and will give give the prestige to that. I don't know a huge amount about these European institutions, but I was, I was, I was a couple of weeks ago, I was at the National University of Mexico, and I was told that right from its foundation it was about nation building, right. and the idea of Mexico as a nation, and I wonder if part of these European institutions is about building the concept of Europe as a, as a political power block. And it may also have a sense of, you know, let's have the scale to compete with the big American universities. But, but I wonder if there's that other element to it as well. Well, very few people will openly agree with you, but that is true. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that is true, and it is not something new. So I think, you know, my own area is higher education policy, and I have done a lot of work on Europe. But this has been tried previously. I wrote an article, Teaching Europe or Building Europe, and that the attempt is to use... <laughs> Accidentally plagiarizing you. <laughs> <laughs> no, and the attempt is to use this and this is just one particular initiative to use universities really in the way universities were used in the modern age to help building nation states. Mm -hmm. But this time it's not a nation state, it's Europe as a you know, kind of sui generis uh, political construction. But nobody will say that publicly because nobody has the mandate to, uh, to, to, to do that. But it is, it is de facto, I think you're right, happening. So any other uh, so, uh, colleagues who are joining online, please feel free to raise your, your, your hands. I can see names that I recognize here from Africa and America and Southeast Asia, other names that, that I don't, uh, don't recognize, so please feel free to do that. I thought, you know, just to, to, get, well, to get into the discussion even more, that uh, there was already quite a lot here, so I was thinking in terms of, uh, of research, you know, almost everybody had ideas for research projects, so if we, if we were to set up a new PhD program, you know, in higher education and science diplomacy, we would have the subjects for 15 dissertations, potential dissertations. Of course, this is not to say that we want to impose, you know, PhD students should come with their own interest and, uh, you know, passion about what they want to study, but there was quite a lot here, and perhaps, you know, in some form uh, at, uh, at King's we might uh, pursue some of these potential research avenues. So there was a lot, for example, about the role of, uh, I hesitate whether to call them intermediary organizations. That is a little bit demeaning, right? The Council of Europe is not, uh, Council, uh, British Council, what am I saying? Uh, I'm still in Europe. Uh, British, <laughs> British Council is not an intermediary organization, but it's not a university and not a governmental organization. And there are others 
and there is competition even among these uh, organizations, you know, because there is the ADE, there is Council of Europe, there is Campus France, if there still is Campus France, I haven't followed. There is still there Campus, still is France, Campus yes. France. And then there is the Confucius Institute and in America, IREX and, mm -hmm. and, and, and others. So this would be very, very interesting. And in a way, in the mirror, there's also the, the discussion about the agency of higher education institutions themselves. Do they have agency or they are kind of tools or, God forbid, instruments of, uh, you know, um, geopolitics, uh, international relations? I think the, the uh, band's intervention showed that universities have agency and that that is also very, very interesting. There's another, I was thinking another uh, checking if I see any hand yet. Uh, another very interesting question here, potentially uh, research question, is about who is engaged in higher education and science diplomacy. I mentioned previously good guys and, and bad guys, and of course, who am I to say who is the good guy, who is the, who is the bad guy, but there is very little research about what Russia is doing, for example, in terms of uh, higher education diplomacy. And having worked in this, that part of the world, I know that Russia funds so-called Slavonic or Slavic universities in a lot of former Soviet republics and controls them directly. So you, you will see Mr. Lavrov, the current uh, foreign minister of Russia, opening the academic year at the Slavonic University in Kyrgyzstan and in Armenia. Turkey maintains a very large network of uh, higher education institutions and also secondary uh, schools that are funded and controlled by the Turkish government all the way from Central Asia to the Balkans. There is almost no, I mean, I don't know of any research about that, to be, to be honest. There are very influential non-governmental organizations that you know, do higher education and science diplomacy, and that's not only the well-known open society uh, foundations, for example, but Aga Khan. No, uh, and uh, you know, there's very little research about that. So I don't want to. I don't want to <laughs> add to the. To the, there are no uh, people here interested in starting a PhD in uh, any of this now. Okay. <laughs> I, I just comment on that, that that we did do a piece of research. Mm -hmm. When I say we, I, again, I don't mean me. I mean my colleagues right. who are researchers within the British Council. And, and it was published as soft power superpowers. Mm -hmm. It was published in about 2019. And it was looking back at the last five years. And one of the things that it, it, it noted is the, the, the massive expansion in the creation of cultural institutes. So the Confucius Institutes um, grew from 320 to 507 institutes within, within that five year period. And you mentioned Russia and I'm going to mispronounce this, but the Ruskia Mia Foundation, which is the Russian version of this, um, also increased by over 200%. And around the same period of time, we also looked at the number of um, countries that were developing international education strategies. And of course, there's lots of reasons why countries develop international education strategies. Some of it is for the export value of international students and for the, the value and vibrancy that they bring to universities. But most of them also recognised that it had the potential to be um, a tool for influence and, and, and soft power. Um, I would be really interested in someone picking up that and mm -hmm. looking at it because time has passed and also particularly with Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine and the hardening of the relationships between the UK and China and, and also actually the wider geopolitical um, fragmentation of, of, of you know, power bases um, through the world. I think it would be really interesting to see how is that playing out now when it isn't a kind of straightforward competition for influence but it, it, it's, it's kind of really much more polarised. Yeah, so that, that would be another interesting subject. <laughs> it's a kind of competition among these organizations that I will not call intermediary organizations. No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. So there are a few comments uh, on, uh, in the chat, so I'll just read them out and then feel free to um, 
uh, React or just say other things. So one comment is from Iris Kimizoglu from the European Student Union. So very, very nice to have you here, Iris. When it comes to science diplomacy, where is the red line, if there is one, with Belarus and Russia students from Belarus called up when? Uh, so now, with Belarus and Russia students from Belarus called upon European and World University to stop cooperation early on. It took Europe two years to do so after the invasion of war and war on Ukraine. Additionally, who is responsible to draw the red line? Governments, ministries, higher education institutions, academic communities. So that's a very interesting question. Then there's a question from uh, Mikhail Natzler, if I read the name rightly. Where do the panel see universities and science diplomacy and competition come into play in reference to large infrastructure projects and aid? Example, Grazia, EU's global gateway, the numerous US ones, and China's uh, GSI, GDI, BRI. Apology if I got the name abbreviation a little wrong. And then one more, so from uh, Monica Steinel, who is the uh, Deputy Secretary General of the European Student Union. Could you give some, could you give any concrete tips as to how universities can navigate the fine line between science diplomacy and geopolitical realism? What would constitute due diligence for a higher education institution engaging with a difficult partner? So, anybody want to react to any of this? Or just add to the list of questions here, please, Ben. Just to add to the discussion we were having about um, most countries now pr promoting cultural institutes in a way at a level that wasn't happening 10 years ago. We went through very similar with global media, where between about 2007 and 2012, we suddenly had CCTV, Russia Today, Press TV from Iran, Everyone was putting their money into that, and we did kind of comparative research, and they're all targeting slightly different audiences. So it was kind of quite a complicated picture, but just the volume of cash the countries were putting in, it was causing a lot of head scratching in London. Like, should the BBC really try and match what um, what China is doing? And probably not, because it just can't. So the that kind of comparative research can be done, I think, but you just have to be sensitive to the different objectives that they diff have for each country, really. I, I thought, uh, speaking of ideas for research, what you mentioned in your intervention, that you know, it would be interesting to have a research about what students think. Yeah. What are their own perceptions? You know, are they being used in, uh, mm. in, in this? And that you, know, you listed a longer, or you had a longer list of, uh, of questions there. But also, I, I'm not aware of a lot of, uh, of research mm. into into this, uh, this matter because, you know, we focus on governments and big um, organizations and universities eventually. Yeah, yeah I, 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 the one thing I'd, I'd point out first is that uh, I think we talk very generically about science diplomacy or what I talked about, defense diplomacy, as if uh, each and every subject would be the same. And, and, but there, there are important differences between, you know, uh, let's say a very specific uh, engineering area, uh, let's say nuclear technology, uh, that is sensitive and there you, you know, people might learn things that uh, a certain country don't, don't, doesn't want to be exported to country. Imagine you know, uh, Iranian students coming to the UK to learn about nuclear you know, technology. Well, you, you certainly want to, you know, to, to check in how far you know, uh, the knowledge they gain here uh, is, is actually uh, sensitive. And, 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 and there's a precedent for that. I mean, if, if you look at um, the case of Pakistan's nuclear weapons program, it was um, you know, founded by A.Q. Khan, whose education was in Western Europe, and he worked in, in, in Western Europe in, in that area. And, in, and some would argue, you know, that basically the, the Pakistani uh, nuclear program started with, um, with, with what we might call nowadays espionage. Um, so there, there are these areas that are, that are sensitive, that, that are problematic. Uh, and there are other areas that are, you know, arguably much, much less sensitive. You know, if you study music, if you study in a, in a conservatory, in, in, in the, 
I would be very worried about you know uh, Chinese students coming to uh, uh, to London and studying piano or, or whatever. Um, and there's a, a let's say a third element uh, to it is that even though you know someone might come uh, from country X, uh, Russia, be it Russia, be it uh, China, to to the UK or another country, uh, to to get specific skills that they want to take back to their country, yeah, um, okay, that that might be sensitive. But usually, when these when 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 students, young people, come to another or go to another country, they don't. They're not only there for a couple of years and just adopt these skills and then go back. They they get ideas, they get influenced, and 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 hopefully they go back to the countries and 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 come back with you know ideas and values they they learn and and, and change their countries. And 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 yeah, I, I I'm, I'm just want to say two points. I'm now getting to the fourth. Uh, and and the, the, the 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 fourth is really about you know there might be actually you know an an, an interest in uh, interest in almost altruistic interest that that people from other countries come here and take things home that is you know that is our contribution uh, uh to you know to many countries uh in in um in uh, for example in, in in the global south that might have an uh, an interest or where we might have an interest that they learn certain things here and then take them back home thank you so it, it i think the bottom line it's it's complex uh, and perhaps more <laughs> complex than 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 we've recognized so far yeah i can i can speak a little bit um I, I, can, I mean, I'm responding to the question about uh, Chinese funding of, of uh, academic institutions along the BRI, which is a really uh, potentially interesting question. I have not looked at it, so I don't know uh, data on that. But I can, uh, I, I would just hazard to say, and then pivot off and talk about something slightly tangentially related. It would depend, I assume, uh, on... I mean, just because it's Chinese money, as with it, money from anywhere, doesn't mean that it comes with certain conditions about what you can and can't say. I myself was hired by Tsinghua University as a postdoc, uh, and I had a role as a postdoc there in the School of Public Policy and Management from 2013 to 2016. And when I got there, I said to my boss, just be honest with me, is there anything I can't say while I'm here? And I was told, no, you say what you want. In internal discussions, you say what you want. And externally, you say what you want because what they wanted me to do was publish for international journals in social science. Because Tsinghua University, which is one of the top universities in China, has an amazing international record in the rankings, amazing international record in science rankings including in the English language, but not a good record uh, in international publications when it comes to social science. So they were trying to up themselves in the ranking. So they hired me. Um, and they were clear with me, you publish what you want because you're not writing a policy paper and it's not going to be internal, so we're not going to tell you what to write. And they stuck with that. Um, when I went to, to do my PhD at NYU, uh, I had a message. Uh, the one thing that they told me was don't join any demonstrations while you're here because you might get your visa cancelled. And when I went to NYU to start my PhD, I had an email from the NY New York University administration saying the same thing. We advise international students not to join political demonstrations because you might get your visa cancelled. So I thought the equivalence there between the US and China in terms of academic freedom, at least from my perspective, uh, was pretty, you know, pretty telling. Um, I would say that uh, Tsinghua tried to keep me on in 2016. They tried to move me from a postdoc contract to a research associate contract, which would have been longer term. And right at the last minute, as my visa was about to end and I was saying, you know, I need this job, because um, I didn't have one back in the UK, they told me, sorry, for red tape reasons, it's all fallen through, we can't hire you. And that was 2016, and I don't know, but I do wonder if that was a shift in the political terrain and they decided we cannot have a foreign scholar here because it was a, it was a policy think tank where I was working within the School of Public Policy and Management, and I suspect that's what happened. I suspect it was a sign of the turning of the political tide, but um, I, I won't know for sure. Well, as I think we, we knew already, there's a lot that is happening in 
higher education and science, diplomacy, all directions, in all dimensions. I would say, and I might be wrong on that, there is a lot less research on, uh, on that. So that's why when research, scholarship, uh, you know, systematic reflection is available, like what you are doing at the British Council, that is extremely useful. I learned that there is a European network of research on higher education and science diplomacy. When uh, the invitation, the announcement went out for this meeting, I got an email, oh, so good that you are organizing that. I didn't say, did you know about us? But I didn't, so that's, that's, uh, that, that, is, that, is, that is very good to know. So we will see, perhaps, whether we can uh, you know, contribute anything in terms of research at our school, education, communication, and, and society. But I, I was thinking, really, that we have a, a, a very interesting list of questions and issues that are coming up. And I, I wanted to, to go back, perhaps, to two of them that were, were raised here. Uh, Monica Steinel asked about um, uh, you know, how do we decide between science, diplomacy, and geopolitical realism. And some of you mentioned that already. So I think there is an issue of, uh, of mandate there and legitimacy. And I, I have, uh, no, who gives whoever does something the mandate and uh, what makes that a legitimate uh, action or not. I have my own, uh, my own experience here, which is also about another type of engagement in, in, uh, in higher education diplomacy. I have done a lot of work in Myanmar in higher education between the last two military juntas. And once I was in New York and I got a call from the Minister of Education who is now in the jungle, you know, uh, fearing for his life, who said you should come and convince Aung San Suu Kyi to do something, a big project that they, uh, they had on university autonomy, come and meet her on the margin of some meeting there. And I went, I flew overnight just to meet uh, Suu Kyi. There were only two persons in that meeting who didn't speak Burmese, uh, so I couldn't communicate with, with a lot of people. And the entire government was there with some people in military uniforms, including the one who is now the military leader of the country. And they got into a row in the middle of the, of the discussion, and there was no chance for me to talk with Suu Kyi or, or with, uh, with anybody, so I, I didn't have the chance. But I, you know, that, that was what the minister wanted was to convince her to uh, basically give universities, public universities in Myanmar autonomy. And I, you know, I asked myself, but who am I to, to, to do that? You know, what do I have the, the right? You know, is there any element of legend? So I'm happy to help if I can. But uh, you know, and that you, I know from other examples, you can get into very, very difficult uh, questions as an institution or as an individual when you know, freelancing is the, the worst of all, of, uh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, um, it, I think this is a really, really interesting question. I was also struck by the question that Ben was asking about, you know, how do you persuade people to fund science diplomacy when it is actually so hard to prove the diplomatic benefits? And um, um, I, I should admit I worked in the government department when the Newton Fund was being discussed and, and set up. Um, and one of the things that I think is that the diplomatic benefits are usually a collateral benefit of you doing something else. So a lot of science collaboration is really about the science. You know, we note it, you know, we often talk about the fact that the pandemic and the need for scientists from across the world to come together and work together and in fact do the opposite of have a small yard and a big fence. Actually, you know, you're not going to be able to keep um, global um, pathogens out through a, through, through a big fence. So that's one of the things that I do think is quite interesting by a lot of this knowledge diplomacy and science diplomacy. It's usually, at least overtly, and often really, about the science or the knowledge more than it is about the diplomacy, mm -hmm. even though with something like the Newton Fund, you know, there, there were lots of different drivers. One of them was there's a whole load of emerging economies and they're investing in science. And the UK wants to maintain its own leadership in science by having relationships and the opportunities to work with these scientists as they emerge. Uh, and so it, you know, it was in that space rather than let's use the fact that we're working in a science collaboration with 
you know, a middle-income state that might otherwise come under the influence of Russia and China to, to, to adopt our values um, instead. That's very interesting, too. I, I wanted to challenge you, Ben, on, on something you, you said, uh, that not much has changed uh, recently. And I mean, you put it in, in terms that probably I, I would agree with. But I, I wanted to test this, actually, rather than, than, than challenge you. Because you know, thinking of Russia, for example, before the war in Ukraine, Russia was a member of the European higher education area. There was a lot of cooperation, a lot more than before the Cold War between Western uh, European American universities and Russian universities, and that stopped uh, completely, basically, after the invasion in, uh, in, uh, of Ukraine. The European University Association decided to suspend all uh, Russian universities and their membership after the uh, Russian rector signed uh, that uh, letter of support. So I think the way I see it is perhaps not that there is a new Iron Curtain, you know, dividing Europe. But there's a little bit of an iron veil, if I may call it so. And not only in Europe, but in, in, in other, there are new lines of fracture. And I, I have also the feeling that higher education and science diplomacy is realigning, at least in some areas or on some topics, if not geographic and ge geopolitical areas. And there is a kind of Cold War, new Cold War wing. But I might be wrong being, you know, having, uh, you know, being raised in a communist country. I don't want to experience that ever again and being on the other side of a curtain. So it could be just that I'm, I'm, I'm biased and uh, overly concerned about something that doesn't happen. I, well, I wouldn't disagree uh, with w what you've just uh, said. So if you look at the higher education sector more broadly or universities in, 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 in general, um, Obviously, the, the invasion of, of Ukraine by Russia has had uh, an impact, as you've just described. And I think that basically answers the question about, you know, in how far can uh, universities be free of the geopolitical realities of the day? And, 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 and probably they can't be completely isolated from, from what is going on out there. Um, I, th I think... It, a certain degree of independence is, is, is good, but it's, 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 it's difficult to kind of uh, completely say, uh, yeah, we, you know, it's what is going on in, in the world is, is, is not, um, is, it doesn't matter in, in, in the university sector. I, th I think the, 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 let's say, science cooperation or, or cooperation between universities um, in a situation as the one where that we see now with with Russia and and, and Ukraine, it's almost a wicked problem. And, it, and the, the the problem is that on the one hand, um, you don't want to see you know even the universities to collaborate with a country that has so blatantly violated the most fundamental norms on which the international system is based. I mean, the the, the outright invasion. Of, of Ukraine, I mean that is just, I mean, I mean, probably most of us couldn't believe in January that that this is going to happen, and and, and here we are. Um, so on the one hand, you don't want to see to you know to work and collaborate in in a friendly way with with a with a country uh, that has done something like that, but at the same time, there's the country, there's the nation, there's the state, uh, and they're the individuals. Right. And, and at the individual level, actually, you might have very fruitful collaboration going on. You might be able to, perhaps to a very small degree, influence public opinion if, if you keep on collaborating, if you keep on working. Uh, and and it, I don't have the answer. I feel it's someone in the audience, had, but it, it's, a, it's a wicked problem. So on the one hand, yeah, you don't want to punish the individuals who are not really responsible for it, and there might be benefit to collaborating with them, but but in general that will would look really really bad. Um, and yeah, it's it's how are you going to resolve that? And uh, uh, I think uh, in the case of Russia, what 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 we've seen is that at least in the short term there had to be for geopolitical reasons that that clear distinction. But I think in, in, in the not too distant future, hopefully, it, it's again one of those areas where science diplomacy helps to, to, to break that, 
iron veil uh, that, that, that you've just described. And, and if you look at the end, uh, you know, at the research about the end of the Cold War and, and the role of uh, epistemic communities, especially in the arms control society, uh, uh, com uh, community, where basically Russian uh, scientists working on on uh, uh, WMD and 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 uh, ballistic missiles and and uh, their U.S. counterparts worked together and, and created some sort of common understanding that then trickled up to to the political leaders and and, and created the foundation for for. Uh, a rapprochement and, and, and the arms control agreements that, 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 that we have seen. It obviously hasn't worked perfectly, but, but there was you know, some, some benefit to it, and, and, and I think we, we are going to see that hopefully in the not too uh, distant future. But it's, 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 a, it's a problem that, that doesn't really have a, no. you know, a, a right answer to it. Yes. Or the band might disagree. Yes. No, 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 it's kind of connects um, a few points here. Like when we had the soft power committee in, in Parliament, trying to get the politicians to understand that if you do these scientific cooperations, the, the benefits might not be visible for yeah. 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah. But if, you're not, if you don't trust yourself to invest in it and do it, then you're out of the game, really. So it's partly about, in this Iron Veil situation, can we still have the trust in these institutions to, to keep these corporations going? And it does seem quite perilous at the moment because the, the, the kind of decline in trust in China from the US and some in Europe, it's making it difficult to have that kind of, you know, we could have scientific cooperation with China in similar ways, but it seems we're not quite heading in that direction. Hmm. But, um, but in the long term, that would make sense. Yeah, but then it, 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 we, we shouldn't forget that it takes two to tango mm. uh, and uh, and and we uh, you know, not now in the case of Russia but in the, in the case of of China where, where where the state does have or the Communist Party does have much way you know I, I don't want to you know talk about the area you, you obviously know much more about um, uh, Jane than I do but where, where the Communist Party or the state has much more influence on what is going on in universities and, 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 and you know, if, if you look at, at the evidence, there, there is at least some intent by, by the Chinese to, to, you know, to, to, uh, to make use of um, uh, Chinese students coming to Western countries to come to the US and, and, and benefit directly uh, the, the technological uh, development uh, and economic development of, of China in a way that, you know, uh, you know, where, where you could perhaps to an under, uh, a degree understand uh, the, the Biden administration's position, but it's obviously one part in, in uh, and you, you, the, the, the question is how can you build trust, trust that needs to, to exist along the board that you can have basically that, that open scientific exchange. Uh, if one side perhaps does... Oh, doesn't play by, by, by the same rules mm. um, that you'd like them to play by. Yeah, the discussion about trust and whether we, we uh, collaboration with Russia uh, prompted me to remember that I was watching recently a webinar on, I, I believe it was, it was similar to this, it was high, higher education collaborations um, by the, uh, and it's online, the National the National Committee of US and China Relations. And they have some great webinars on there, quick plug. And um, I was watching one, and I believe the academic's name was Stephen Chu. And, and the same question came up, and he gave this example. He said that, I may be getting my facts wrong because I'm just remembering back to it, but I believe it was the Cuban <coughs> Missile Crisis and he said that the way that they were uh, able to lower, this is 1964, I think, they were, the way that they were able to lower tensions, the, the, the back channels of the discussion, started off <coughs> via the physicists, the Russian and the US physicists talking to each other. Have you heard of that? Did you know yeah, that? Yeah. Okay, so, so right. It, it should mean, be a popular right, right. almost mythology. Right, so that's a massive argument. Yeah favor of keeping these discussions, yeah. these collaborations going. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's another fascinating thing. So cooperation between 
right, or science diplomacy in, involving yeah, yeah. Uh, Soviet Union and the United States during the, the Cold War, because that happened you yeah, know, in a very, very interesting ways. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, was, I, mean, I, I really agree, and, and one of the roles that we play is that the UK has a general belief that some engagement is better than no engagement and you right. never really want to be in a situation where you're completely cut off and have no, mm -hmm. you know, no channels of engagement. Um, I mean, going to the problem that Ben <coughs> was talking about, from the British Council's point of view, we try and keep the channels open until it is absolutely impossible to because something so egregious has happened that, 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 that we can't justify it. But we do often get engaged in conversations by universities that, that perhaps we're encouraging to do something, you know, like engage in a PhD programme with Saudi Arabia just after Saudi has done something which contravene international norms of behaviour. And universities do quite rightly say, well, we're not sure about this, we're not sure about the reputational damage to us to, to, to doing this. And to the extent that we can, we try to give political cover and say, see if you can persuade your board that you should do this because this is part of trying to support the progressive elements. Um, but uh, you know, uh, as Ben was saying, there's, there's no easy answer in every single case. I think those responsible for the governance of a university have got to think really hard about the risks to reputation, to security, to you know, other things that, that might occur if they continue engagement with a particular institution. Um, and we'd love the government to give more guidance, but they can't because their knowledge comes from covert security sources. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, there is now legislation on the way about uh, foreign interference in academic yeah. cooperation, yeah. Um, any interventions from the room or online? Yes, please. Yeah, there will be a microphone coming so that colleagues who are still online with us can hear. I was interested earlier in some of the comments that um, Ben, number one, Ben Falafin here was saying. <laughs> there are a lot um, of Ben's on this panel. Yeah, uh, about uh, Jake Sullivan and uh, the U.S. and this new age of strategic competition. And uh, we framed a lot of that in the near term with the small yard, high fence, kind of security concerns. But I wonder... Um, Beyond that, in the short term, maybe in the medium term, how a lot of this is kind of inevitable with just demographic trends with kind of rich, wealthy nations growing more aged and a supply side human talent resources diminishing over time. And um, I'm curious what kind of incentive structures we could make if we thought that was undesirable to try to, among allies, uh, reduce that competition and uh, maybe to a point Ben over here was making. Um, to what degree it would be desirable to export some of these um, this higher education and actually how it might behoove us in the long term when we have to rely on migrant workers and external talent to have some of these programs abroad mm -hmm. built up. Yeah. So ben and Ben, would you like to react? Thank you. Um, I'm thinking of if, uh, if my son is a brilliant physicist in India right now and part of a huge demographic swell that's going on, and he's got a choice between I could go to MIT or there's the new Euro, <coughs> Euro multi-partner um, superstar university. Um, it's all about leaving, as you say, and so because of demographic shifts. So it would make, uh, you can see the rationality from the EU's point of view. Yeah, if they're talented, let's get them to us. But geopolitically, that might be quite bad for India if they don't get to go back to India afterwards. So this is a really big problem because like we as universities kind of usually make money if we go and set up a campus in Calcutta or wherever. Um, so the, instrumentally we might do it anyway. But oh, I don't know, I haven't really thought about this before because from India's point of view, surely, I mean, do you mind if Europe sets up a, a big new campus in a city in India? Is it like a knock to your pride or a sign that your, your young people are really talented and are worth investing in? Well, I think we're going to see this in the next decade, but it's, it's a really good point. I've never thought about this before, but yeah, 
but well, that's that's not allowed in India. You can't do it under the law. Really? No. Yeah. So oh. that's uh, that are very strict okay. bar barriers to international cooperation in general, and in particular opening foreign. Camp. It's not like China used no. to be, or uh, perhaps still is actually. I don't know, but India, no. So uh, it's okay. Uh, it's different. Ben? I think the, well, obviously demographic trends um, will affect. Uh, the higher education sector in, in, in any country in, in, in the Western world because the general population is declining in, 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 in many uh, countries of the global south, especially uh, in Africa because you know, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the population is incre increasing uh, quite rapidly and, and universities need to, to uh, respond to that. Um, I, I'm a bit more skeptical that uh, when it comes to then the actual uh, long-term planning, saying, okay, so, oh, okay, yeah, so we have all these, you know, long-term trends and, 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 uh, and challenges in the next 30 to 40 years, you know, this is going this way or, or that way, so now we need to invest in another country or something. I'm very skeptical that this is actually going, going to happen. I, I don't think this, this long-term thinking is, 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 is really going on um, and maybe uh, you know you could argue it shouldn't because all that we know uh, is that these are trends and um, you know trends can go one way or another uh, you know, that they're, there's all the, it's very difficult to predict uh, the future and then to make these very long-term Investments on, on, on something that is uh, you know that is just a trend, uh, but you know not don't know if it's going to happen. You know it's it's it's, it's challenging. Um, okay, well uh, I think we are at the end of our 90 minutes. I am uh, alerted, so uh, I wanted to thank all of you on the on the panel for your very interesting and thought-provoking uh, comments and and insight. I want to thank. The audience uh, again uh, here in the room and online for your patience for bearing with us for <laughs> for these 90 minutes. I cannot promise that we are going to start a PhD program in uh, higher education and science diplomacy at King's or even at uh, at ECS, but perhaps there would be ways to continue this reflection and. Uh, you know, if you know anybody who needs research on these uh, topics, uh, bring them to bring them to us. I'm also saying this for for those who are uh, online. But what we are going to do, and you can see this uh, this slide. So there is a website, uh, a mini website, for the series Education and Society Dialogues, and there you will see the link. For now, it is a Twitter uh, community. I'm not sure it will stay Twitter uh, after everything that is happening with Twitter, but we want to create an online um, interactive uh, place for this kind of discussions to, to continue, you know, with blogs and, and reactions to blogs. And also, we are going to put there some papers of, for example, Diane, uh, Stone, who was supposed to talk about the state of research on this topic today and couldn't come, has written about this and we'll put this paper there in a slide so it will be possible to, to, to access that. So we hope that this discussion will, uh, will, uh, will continue. But until then, once again, thank you very much. I also would like to thank uh, my uh, colleagues, uh, David Pepper and Marilyn Alford from ECS for helping us with framing this discussion. I want to thank my colleagues uh, Jade Crump and Louis Todd also from ECS for helping with the logistics and I want to thank Cleo Fatureci for organizing everything brilliantly as over and also colleagues from King's Venues for uh, you know making uh, making us work making everything work today so thank you very much there will be a reception everybody is invited except colleagues who could only join online, sorry for that. Uh, and then we, we should just follow Cleo because it will we'll go to another room. So thank you all so much. Thank you.